Welcome to Convede House. 30 years ago, when I was a PhD student, I was set to teaching human anatomy to medical students, and this was not easy because they regarded it as tedious and irrelevant. So I looked for examples of well-known anatomy teachers who'd made a success of it, and historically the outstanding anatomist was Robert Knox. His dates were 1791 to 1862. He was the most famous anatomist in Britain, and he was the most written about British doctor in history until he was usurped by Harold Shipman. In 1990, Knox maintained his notoriety through his association with the Westport murders. He was the anatomist who purchased bodies from Burke and Hare, and there was a resurgence of interest when the human tissue scandals of the late 20th century broke, and again raised the question of property in human cadavers and organs. Knox's work, however, had been largely forgotten, although in his day he was regarded as being at the very forefront of anatomical science. I was struck by the fact that there was no biography that dealt with his work as opposed to his uh, personal life and the Burke and Hare scandals. Twenty years later, there still wasn't one, so I wrote one, and it sank without trace. And I, a number of people who've read the book still couldn't really see what it was that Knox did, which I regard as a, a kind of failure. So this is a summary of his life in the first talk, and then his work, because... As I've studied Knox's work over the years, and I, as far as I know, I've read every word that Knox ever wrote, I have come to see him as a significant intellectual force in 19th century biology, uh, whose work is foundational and deserves to be better known. One of the objections people have to studying anatomy is that it's all known it's all been done, there's nothing left to do, so it's, as a subject it has come to a dead end, it has used itself up. This is based on a failure to understand what anatomy is. There is topographical anatomy, the parts of the body and where they all are, and then there is what Knox called the higher anatomy, uh, an anatomy that's uh, explanatory. Why are bodies like they are? How did they develop in this way? How did we evolve? And how does this knowledge of how we're made affect how we live? This is the higher anatomy. After his death, Knox was known for two things, uh, buying the bodies of murder victims and his book, The Races of Men. The second major strand of his work was on evolutionary theory, species change and the development of species. His work predates Darwin and this explains why it has been largely forgotten because either it is consistent with Darwin's work in which case he's merely a forerunner and Darwin supersedes him or else it isn't consistent in which case Darwin replaces him but either way Knox has been sidelined. Uh, his Theorising, however, still contains much interesting material that is particularly significant as classical Darwinian evolution is increasingly challenged. The purpose of this talk is to put Knox's work into the context of his life. In the history of science, it isn't like the history of art in which the, the work of the artist is largely independent of their life. Knox's theorising cannot be separated from his life experiences because they provide the evidence, 
and they also tell us something about his thinking. The most obvious example is that for Knox there is no progress. Knox was a revolutionary, but not a progressive. In the words of one of his students, Knox preached a doctrine of despair, a kind of deconsecrated Calvinism. He also has a, an idiosyncratic relationship with the truth, in that if the truth is, is over here, then Knox is over there somewhere, uh, out of the picture. He was notoriously unreliable, and much of his work is a kind of a joke. It's, it's a kind of persiflage. Remember that he's not addressing a professional audience. For most of his life, he's writing popular works, and they need to be seen in this context. He's providing entertainment, and he is deliberately out to shock, and that is what makes him popular. He is probably the first popular scientist, a popular teacher of anatomy. He's a showman. His work belongs in, in a music hall as much as it does in a lecture hall, and it's necessary to understand this in order to read it in the proper way. Let's start in Edinburgh in 1791, when Knox is born. He's the eighth of nine children. His father is a teacher of mathematics and also an accountant, and his mother is the daughter of a German immigrant farmer. He comes from a, what we'd now call a lower middle class family. Edinburgh is a university town, and the university is basically a, a medical school. Most of the Edinburgh students are medical students. Knox's family home is at Four Newington Place, which is very close to Surgeon Square, the location of the Edinburgh College of Surgeons, which is now the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, and the private anatomy schools in which students learnt their anatomy. And he grows up in a, in a medical atmosphere, in, and also in a, a revolutionary atmosphere. He's born in the time of the French Revolution, and to appreciate its impact, one has to understand that the, the effect of the French Revolution on Scotland, Scotland is a country that has very close historical links to France. They're closer than the links to England, the, the Jacobite monarchs, the kings over the water, live in France. There's a French influence on Edinburgh universities, which are not unlike Oxford and Cambridge. They're not um, institutions that require uh, religious allegiance. You don't have to subscribe to the 39 articles of the Anglican faith in order to go there. There are universities for free thinkers. And here in this environment, revolution seems an attractive prospect. And this isn't a, a question of peasants revolting. Edinburgh at the time has about 85,000 inhabitants, and the total number of electors for Edinburgh's MP is 33. So almost everybody outside the aristocracy and the very wealthy are disenfranchised, including all of what we would now think of as the middle class. So throughout his life, Knox can work in Edinburgh, he teaches there, he lives there, but he has no say in the governance of the city. Another influence is the church, the kirk, but that's something that Knox's family don't belong to. They don't, they're not conventionally religious. Knox is often described as an atheist, although he did read his Bible every night, but he didn't belong to any established church. So he's growing up outside the, the normal structures. And his father was something of a revolutionary. He was a Freemason. He joined societies that talked about reform and revolution. And the government was sufficiently concerned to try to suppress 
some of these organisations. Knox inherited his father's radicalism, although he never seems to have done anything about it. Uh, as far as we know, he never joined any radical society, he never read any radical literature or voiced any political opinions, except that in conversation he idolised Napoleon Bonaparte. And uh, at least in part, this was due to Knox's constant desire to shock people, but his revolutionary fervour amounted to zero. It was mostly a performance. When he's a young child, Knox contracts smallpox. This leaves him scarred all over with smallpox scars. His face is scarred, he's blind in his left eye, uh, he's always rather short of scalp hair. No one would have described him as good looking and in later life, from a, a fiery youth, he became noted for his even temper and being impossible to provoke. And when someone approached him in the street and said, Dr. Knox, I think you are the ugliest man in Edinburgh, he replied, in that case, you cannot have seen my brother. Knox went somewhat late to Edinburgh High School, which was about 10 minutes walk from the family house. He matriculated at the school in 1806 at the age of 14. The curriculum was largely classical. He learned Latin, Greek, French, history, philosophy. And when he left the school in 1810, he was head of school. He won the gold medal as the most outstanding student and he must have expected a brilliant career. The school itself was situated next to Edinburgh's red light district, and in the road approaching it, there were 27 houses of ill repute, which raised the, the issue of how do you get to school without passing a brothel? Well, the answer, of course, is you go in them. So by the time he finished his education, uh, Knox had acquired a, a wide variety of life experiences that would serve him in good stead in the future, and he was always something of a ladies' man. For an educated man of modest means who was not uh, a member of any established church, the obvious career was in medicine. From the windows of the school, Knox could see Surgeon Square. He could easily have got into conversation with the medical students and discovered what sort of life it was. So, of course, on leaving, he immediately matriculated at Edinburgh University. All you had to do was pay a fee, sign the register. The exams were at least three years away. They were in Latin, which should not have presented him with any problems since he was the head of a school that was noted for teaching Latin. And he embarked on his studies. Edinburgh, at the time, like the rest of Scotland, overproduced doctors. The reason that the archetypal doctor was a Scotsman well into the 1960s was that this had always been the case. E Edinburgh had a very good medical school. It had a small population, so it would be expected that its graduates would eventually spread all over the world to practice their trade. First they had to pass their exams, and one of the most difficult was anatomy. It's quite difficult to learn. It's much easier to learn if you can see some human bodies being dissected. The teaching at Edinburgh was notoriously bad. There were three generations of Monroes who were professor of anatomy, and Knox was there in the time of the last of these, Munro Tertius, who was really living on the reputation of his father and grandfather. The teaching was uninspiring and there was hardly any dissection because it was very hard to get subjects to dissect. The dissecting room was a tough place to be. There were no face masks, 
and there were no gloves. Anatomists handled the viscera with their bare hands and often contracted infections. There was also an appalling stench as the bodies were not fixed in form, formalin or formaldehyde as they are now, but were fresh or after a few days not fresh. Knox failed his anatomy exam, which was quite an achievement as some of the students had trouble with the Latin and had to hire Latin tutors to help them. Knox didn't have that problem. He obviously just genuinely didn't know the subject. And so after this, he availed himself of the services of a private anatomy teacher at an anatomy school. And he joined the anatomy school of John Barclay, which was in Surgeon Square, and there he would have acquired sufficient experience to allow him to learn topographical anatomy. And the next year, in 1814, he passes his examinations, he writes his thesis in Latin, and he becomes a doctor of medicine of the University of Edinburgh, which confers him the right to teach and practice all over the world, as it says on his diploma. In the year after his graduation, 1815, Knox comes to London, where he can't practice because the Royal College of Physicians has a monopoly on the practice of physic within the metropolis. He attends the school of John Abernethy at Barts and is disappointed with what he sees describing Abernethy as a buffoon. Then, Fortunately for Knox comes the Battle of Waterloo and surgeons are in demand, so he joins the army. He joins the army as a hospital assistant. This is a newly created commissioned rank that actually raises the status of army doctors, which was fairly low. Knox held the Queen's warrant, but he wasn't actually a commissioned officer, and he had to supply his own uniform and instruments. Off he went to Waterloo to treat the wounded, uh, where he also had the advantage that he was fluent in French, so he could converse with the French soldiers who'd fought for his idol, Napoleon. And after that, for a while, he was in charge of the, the naval hospital at Hilsey, near Portsmouth. Having obtained some military experience, he decided to take a posting to the Cape Colony, which is the southern part of modern South Africa, which had been under British rule since 1814, the British having taken it from the Dutch. It was clearly almost like the end of the world. It was a posting that no one would take if they could have found work at home. It was a formative experience for Knox in that he encountered firstly different races of men, which fascinated him, and also wilderness, which again fascinated him. Knox's encounter with the wilderness was his own Call of the Wild, a philosophical epiphany. The landscape calls forth feelings and passions that man has no language to describe. A chord in his brain which civilization has masked and thrown into abeyance but could not destroy. The chord which makes him independent of artificial things, reminding him that he was made to walk and hunt on that landscape, unfettered, unrestrained. With this landscape he cannot choose but sympathise. It is the field on which nature first placed him. His whole existence harmonises with it. His physiological destiny proclaims it as his own. In later life he would tell stories of his adventures uh, riding across the, the plains. He was the only surgeon for a hundred miles. He would undertake operations that no one else would perform and he fitted into Cape society very well. Cape society was uh, comparatively small. He actually had considerable difficulties. He 
befriended the man who went on to become the governor of the colony, Andres Stockenstrom, and for a while all went well, but then there was a falling out involving Stockenstrom's brother and an apparently trumped up charge of theft that seems to have developed because of ill feeling between the Dutch and the British and arguments about army promotion. When the case came to court, Knox's evidence was discredited and he was shamed as a liar. Things went from bad to worse with the arrival of a retired Royal Navy Lieutenant called Bishop Burnett. Burnett was a friend of the Stockenstroms and no friend of Knox's. They quarrelled with each other and it ended up with Burnett hitting Knox with a whip in front of some of the other officers whereon Knox ran off to get his sword and inflicted a minor wound on Burnett, who fell onto the ground, but Knox could then do nothing, and this whole embarrassing duel resulted in Knox's disgrace. He was excluded from society, and he returned on the next boat to England, arriving there at the very end of 1820. He then went to Paris, which was the home of the anatomists who'd inspired him, Etienne Geoffroy Saint-Hilaire, Georges Cuvier, and Henri-Marie Ducroté de Blainville. We'll talk more of these later in the talk on Knox's evolutionary theory. He attended classes from all three of these men, but not notably from Lamarck, whose progressive theories failed to interest him. He also undertook more dissection in the company of Thomas Hodgkin, a future general practitioner, discoverer of Hodgkin's disease, and a devout Christian who was appalled by some of Knox's tales of the oppression of the native peoples of the Cape. Hodgkin wanted Knox to go public and to expose some of the massacres that had occurred. Knox was understandably reluctant because he was still a serving officer on half pay and had been in enough trouble as it was. And so he remained silent, but it was something that would be on his mind throughout his career. He then returns to his native Scotland and becomes curator of the College of Surgeons Museum. He begins to make contributions to the academic literature, drawing particularly on his observations of the humans and the wildlife of the Cape Colony. In 1823, he marries. Little is known of his wife, Susan Knox, except that she comes from a lower class and is not acceptable in society. Susan never comes to Edinburgh as Knox's wife. They, they live in Leith. In later life, Knox runs an eccentric household where his socially more acceptable sister sometimes poses as his wife. His marriage incentivizes him to do better. He is elected a Fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh in 1823. He also begins to teach anatomy as an assistant to Barclay. In 1825, he's offered a partnership by Barclay. His lectures at that time are described by Richard Owen, who would himself go on to become a very distinguished anatomist, as the most brilliant ever delivered. We don't know exactly what Knox taught, but he's teaching more than just topographical anatomy. He's clearly already teaching about race, and he's teaching about species change, and he's introducing the observations he made on his travels. On Saturdays, he gives lectures on comparative ethnology. These attract so much interest that some people come from as far away as England in order to hear him. 
The teaching of anatomy was part of the Enlightenment program. The idea that in order to understand humanity, you must understand how humans are put together. This is something that has been lost in the wake of behaviorism and the view that humans are disembodied spirits, independent actors who are not constrained by their biology, culminating uh, in an all-time low with the postmodern view of biology as a social construct. Knox is teaching the opposite. We are creatures who have been placed in our environment. We are constrained by our physical makeup and we must understand that. We must understand how we are related to other creatures, how we fit into the environment as a whole and how that our behaviour is as determined as our form. Knox's course for medical students, which was attended by hundreds of students, at the most 500 at the height of his popularity, boasted access to subjects for dissection. At the time, all of the private anatomy schools obtained their subjects from body snatchers. This was well known. There were clearly not enough legally supplied bodies, either by donation, which was almost unheard of, or from people sentenced by the courts to be dissected as an addition to the death penalty. So the schools had to supplement their numbers by robbing graves. Uh, this has become a nuisance. Knox's assistants purchased bodies from William Burke and William Hare, an Irish duo who lived in the slum district of Westport. When one of the inhabitants of their cheap lodging house died, they decided that they would be worth more dead than alive and sold the body to Dr. Knox. Thereafter, they sold almost 20 additional murder victims. Burke and Hare were never body snatchers. These were delivered to Knox's school and mostly received by his assistants. In the words of one visitor to Westport, the excrementitious matter of some 40 or 50,000 individuals is thrown daily into the gutters. It would not have been on anyone's Visit Scotland list. Any discussion of Knox's life will include a, an evaluation of whether he knew that the subjects in his dissection room were being murdered. This is unlikely as they were killed by burking, so Burke sat on their head or put a pillow on their head and then Hare pulled their legs so they made excess respiratory effort and suffocated, they having previously been plied with drink in order to incapacitate them. And this would not particularly leave any marks. And to put this in context, most of the bodies coming in would be from people living in slum areas who would not be in terribly good shape anyway, and some of them would already have been buried. So there would probably have been nothing to see. There were two high-profile cases. One was a man with what we'd now call learning difficulties. It was called Daft Jamie, who was conspicuous because although he was the size of a grown man, he had the, the mind of a child and would play with the local children. So he was missed and he was a fairly distinctive figure because he had a deformity at his feet. The other was a, a very attractive prostitute called Mary Patterson, who's become a kind of folklore figure for having been drawn in Knox's dissecting room and apparently recognised by some of the medical students. The evidence for any of these claims seems to be fairly shallow. Uh, Mary Patterson probably was a prostitute. She was definitely purchased on behalf of Knox. I don't think she was known to any of the medical students. I don't imagine she was as beautiful as it was made out. And I do think that the drawing of Mary Patterson, which appears in various places, including my own book, it was probably a, a, a fake in that it was a, a life drawing that was simply said to have been of Mary Patterson. I don't think there's any evidential chain connecting Mary with the drawing. 
Nevertheless, the image of the voluptuous woman in the dissecting room has become emblematic of the crimes of Burke and Hare. In all, Knox purchased 16 bodies of murder victims, which would have been about one-sixth of the total number of bodies used in the dissecting room during the year. Finally, the crimes came to the notice of the police, who turned up at Knox's premises. He swore at them out of the window and threatened to blow their brains out with a pistol. He was never terribly keen on authority. Burke and Hare went to trial. Hare turned the equivalent of Queen's evidence and so was pardoned. Burke was sentenced to death and publicly hanged. Knox was never charged with anything. Much of the problem with the trial was that people found it difficult to accept that Burke and Hare, the Irish immigrants, had been sufficiently intelligent to think up the scheme on their own and that somebody must have coached them in how to commit undetectable murders and that this person must have been Knox. This wasn't the opinion of commentators outside Scotland and uh, an English newspaper called The Sun opined that the crimes of Burke and Hare had been far too original for the inferior conceptions of a Scotsman. There was certainly a great deal of bad feeling about Knox and the, the usual mobs gathered threatening to lynch him to which he responded by walking around armed with a sword and pistols like a pirate out of a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta. The crowd gathered outside his house, one or two windows were broken. Other than that, no harm was done. Knox continued to go to his work every single day without harm. And after a few weeks, the local scandal melted away. There is no bad publicity and attendance at Knox's classes was higher than ever. In the early 1830s, Knox's relations with the Edinburgh College of Surgeons soured and he was eventually forced out as curator of the museum. He was also asked to resign his army position which deprived him of his half pay. He now had no guaranteed income but this was not a problem as his classes were more popular than ever and his students presented him with a gold cup and three rousing cheers. In 1832, the Anatomy Act was passed that regulated the supply of bodies to anatomy schools. Many of the bodies used were still obtained by grave robbing and Knox's ledgers show bodies purchased from shadowy individuals with names like the Black Bull Man and the Man by the Canal, which suggests some dodgy dealings in nocturnal Edinburgh. One of the consequences of the Anatomy Act was to bias anatomy teaching in favour of the university. Since Knox's time, students had shunned the substandard teaching of the Monroes and gone to the independent anatomy schools. Now, however, Her Majesty's Inspector of Anatomy was preferentially directing cadavers to the university. Knox was struggling to find subjects for dissection and by 1836 was unable to offer any practical classes in Edinburgh. In 1837, Knox applied for the University Chair in General Pathology at Edinburgh. So disliked was Knox by the Academy that they voted to abolish the chair rather than appoint him to it. Knox could only read the injustice of students being forced to go to inferior teachers because he had no supply of bodies was oppressive in the highest degree, iniquitously unjust and simply devised to suit the views of corrupt corporate bodies. Go on, Robert, say what you really think. At the same time, there was a worsening of Knox's relations with the Royal Society of Edinburgh. 
This was not due to the Westport murders, but to his own caustic manner, describing the society as rapidly hastening to the guidance of bankers' clerks, fifth-rate medical practitioners and the like, who would gain nothing of science and as little honour. At a meeting of the Royal Society on the 4th of December 1837, Knox described Professor John Stark as a dabbler in science who appeared to be stark raving mad. Knox himself did what any Edinburgh man would have to be desperate to do and tried to make a living in Glasgow where his anatomy school collapsed after a few years for want of students. As someone who was once banned by my own students from talking about philosophy, I can sympathise with the problem that Knox's lecturing was becoming somewhat too transcendental. He tended to diverge onto philosophical questions and shirk the dry anatomical details which he knew so well. In 1841, Knox was devastated by the death of his wife, Susan. He broke down and exclaimed over and over again, She's gone. She's gone. And this was from a man famous for not showing his feelings. There was nothing to keep him in Scotland any longer. In 1843, Knox joined the Ethnological Society of London, one of the prominent members of which was his old friend Thomas Hodgkin, and proposed another expedition to the Cape, although nothing came of this. He decided instead to go to London and fulfil his ambition to become a teacher of popular anatomy. One of the many myths surrounding Knox's career is that he ended it as a, a lecturer in a travelling circus. He certainly did not, although he did appear at the Egyptian Hall where Attractions included a mammoth horse, a polar dog, and Professor Kist's pose plastique, an early form of on-stage nudity. At this period, ethnological exhibitions, sometimes unfortunately known as human zoos, became popular, where people of exotic races were put on display in European cities. Knox took advantage of this fashion to produce his most popular book, The Races of Men. In the introduction, he writes, The doctrine which teaches us to love our neighbours as ourselves is admirable, no doubt, but a difficulty lies somehow or other in the way. What is the difficulty which all seem to know and feel, yet do not like to avow? It is the difference of race. Ask the Dutch boar for his warrant to reduce these unhappy races to bondage and slavery, to rob them of their lands and to enslave their children, to deny them the inalienable right of man to a portion of the earth on which he was born. One reviewer called The Races of Men an offensive book. And so it is. It teaches nothing, said the reviewer, and denies everything. It abuses men and institutions. The King of Prussia is an infamous coward. The King of Greece is an idiot and a vulgar goth. The English are grand tyrants by sea. And the civil and religious liberty we assert to possess, it is a fallacy altogether. Welcome to the iconoclastic world of Robert Knox. A more cogent criticism was that Knox treated humans as though they were animals, simply creatures of instinct. And this is central to understanding Knox's work. He sees human behaviour as a function of biology, not of sociology. In Europe, according to Knox, man is at perpetual war with nature because he fails to recognise that humans have developed for the environment in which they live and in which they are intended to live in harmony. For this reason, Knox asserts that Europeans can never colonise Africa because they are not biologically suited to live there. While it was clearly the case that they had colonised Africa and indeed 
Knox found his employment in the Cape, his point was that the occupation could not be sustained. Eventually, those races that were suited to the environment in which they lived would assert their dominance. We'll see in the talk on Knox's racial theory how his writings were misunderstood and later appropriated for uses that were almost the opposite of Knox's intent. Knox's theory of evolution, of species development, is predicated on the idea that there are underlying patterns in embryonic development, so-called transcendental anatomy, which permit only certain structures to form. When offspring with particular characteristics are born, they are either suited or unsuited to their environment. If they are unsuited, they die. If they are suited, they live there. Eventually, every environment will be occupied by those forms that are suited to it, and there will be an ideal form that is most suited. A species can come into existence by a sudden mutation, so-called saltatory evolution, or it can become extinct, but it does not gradually change. This is not Darwinian evolution. The key features of Knox's evolutionary theory are that there is no progress and there is no hierarchy. A myriad of different forms is possible. A whole scale, a whole spectrum of creatures with different forms and sizes and shapes. All are possible. Many will have an environment suited to them. Some will not. Those suited will occupy that environment. Everyone is as good as every other. No one is more or less highly involved. If fossil fish had left records, wrote Knox, then they too would see themselves as the finest work of the creator. The great exhibition of 1851 was followed in 1852 with the publication of Knox's book Great Artists and Great Anatomists, which capitalised on the public's interest in art and anatomy at the time. He used it to express his theories of beauty. Even something as notoriously subjective as beauty is considered by Knox to be biologically determined and an example of ideal type. He enjoyed brief employment as the first professor of anatomy at the Royal Free Medical School in 1853, an appointment that was soon terminated after the certificates from his school were deemed to be invalid. A jealous rival had informed the College of Surgeons back in Edinburgh, who'd contacted their English counterparts to ensure that Knox would remain excluded from gainful employment. The Knox family now had moderate ambitions. Knox lived not far from London Fields in the East End. His daughter was apprenticed to a milliner and his son John to a grocer. John's death at the age of 21 was a further devastation from which Knox never really recovered. Without the hope of life that a healthy, lovely child symbolised, there were only the emblems of approaching dissolution and the fear to die, to go not where, to sink into nothing. Knox tried but failed to gain an appointment teaching anatomy to artists. For him, the perfect and the beautiful had to be understood before one could offer a theory of the nature of man, the origin of race or the unity of organic structures. Because to formulate such a theory required the ability to see beyond the superficial to that which must be ever transcendental and abstract, the eternal truth that lay behind the forms of living creatures. Knox and Darwin were not personally acquainted, although it's probable even possible that Darwin attended Knox's lectures while he was a student in Edinburgh. The publication of On the Origin of Species left Knox unmoved. 
it was not that he disagreed with Darwin, he simply thought the underlying question remained unanswered. And in the talk on Knox's evolutionary theory, we'll discuss what the question actually was. He maintained his preoccupation with race, a subject he said was tabooed, forbidden, interdicted. The one subject who's, that Saxon colonists, he said, whose true intention was to exterminate the heathen, particularly wished to avoid. But, as he said, why conceal the truth? On Tuesday the 9th of December 1862, while working as a pathologist at the Cancer Hospital in London, Knox suffered a stroke, and three days later he was dead. He'd never held a substantive academic appointment. He remains the most influential British anatomist of all time. He was buried at the London Necropolis in Surrey at his own request in a spot where the sun would shine oftenest. It was his final affiliation of harmony with nature and his mother earth. When about to quit forever its mortal abode, the mind sees in blissful visions green fields and running streams. The representation of that earth from which he sprung, and from which he is about to return.